This is the fourth annual Mayor's Housing Summit on Affordable Housing. We are just thrilled. As the Mayor spoke last night, this was a conversation four years ago. This is really growing into a not only a city, but a regional movement, and we're getting national attention for all the great work that you folks that, that you're doing out there. Today's topic is Building Opportunity, a Solutions Forum on Housing. The, over the years, this forum has generated great ideas, great solutions, and with all of you, we're starting to implement that going forward. We're looking forward to a great day of ideas, solutions, and making it and carving a path going forward. I would like to uh, thank a couple of folks, if I may. First of all, as you know, we have Spanish translation and interpretation, and I'd like to thank the Community Language Cooperative for their work in doing this. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't have this. First of all, let me uh, thank Freddie Mac, GHC Housing Partners, PK Management, Postinelli, Dominion, Mile High Development, Chaffa, Jonathan Rose Companies, Perry Rose, Lexton McDermott, Mutual of Omaha Bank, Denver Urban Renewal Authority, Urban Ventures, Gorman and & Company, and Housing Colorado. Let's give our sponsors a round of applause, please. And of course, today's summit wouldn't be possible without our host sponsor, Wells Fargo Bank. Wells Fargo Bank has been involved with the summit for the past four years, and we thank them for their support and their contributions and, and the work they're doing in the community and across the country. I'd like to introduce Keith Lobus. Keith is the Western Region Bank President uh, for the Denver Division. Keith has been with Wells Fargo for 21 years. He manages 900 financial services professionals across the Denver metro area, serving individuals and small businesses and helping them meet their needs. Keith is also very much engaged in our community. He sits on the board of Habitat for Humanity, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, and Volunteers of America. So Keith not only serves us professionally, but as a member of our community. With that, I'd like to introduce Keith Lobus. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Rick, and uh, good morning. And we are really excited at Wells Fargo to have the opportunity to participate in this conference. At Wells Fargo, our mission is simple, and that is to help customers succeed financially. We actively support our communities, and everyone here knows how instrumental affordable housing is to building communities. Our corporate and social responsibility efforts include focus on creating economic empowerment opportunities in underserved communities. As part of that, we strive to help to create affordable and sustainable housing for lower and moderate income households in Colorado. Here in Colorado, we have seen improvement in the housing market from the economic downturn and worst housing crisis in generations just a few years ago. But as many of us know, rent in Denver has skyrocketed. As of March, the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment in Denver Metro is at $1,539. Affordability and inventory are among some of the top challenges that renters are experiencing across the state. The, this environment is also why Wells Fargo is committed to finance several affordable housing projects throughout Denver Metro. We continue to support the mayor's goal to create 6,000 affordable housing units in Denver over the next 10 years. For example, in 2017, we helped finance DHA's Vita at Sloan's Lake Project, 176 unit senior apartment community and healthcare clinic in Lakewood, utilizing the LIHTC and new market tax credits. We currently have over $75 million invested in the Denver metro area for economic development, job creation, and affordable housing. One of our more prominent programs is our Neighborhood Lift Program, a collaboration with Neighborhood Works America and its local network member community resources and housing development corporation.
Neighborhood Lift is the single largest corporate philanthropic effort of its kind in the company's history. It was first introduced in 2014 for Denver and created 252 homeowners there by offering home buyer education as well as down payment assistance. Last year, we made another $4.8 million contribution and expanded Neighborhood Lift for the Denver Aurora community, specifically in the counties of Denver, Adams, Arapaho, Douglas, and Jefferson. We held a two-day launch event where prospective home buyers were able to come in and reserve $15,000 for down payment assistance, moving them one step closer to achieving the dream of home ownership. It was inspiring to know that taking that step toward homeownership would be life-changing for the 243 hard-working families and individuals who will receive the grant. Our Neighborhood Lift program does not stop at affordable housing, though. As part of the program, we offer local initiatives and lift the, blo the block grants to help stabilize communities impacted by the housing crisis. Just last week, we donated $250,000 to three local nonprofits intended to support behavioral health resources, financial education, counseling programs to community members throughout, the Denver, throughout Denver and Aurora. In closing, Wells Fargo continues to focus on affordable, achievable, and sustainable housing in Colorado. We have learned through experience of the meaningful impact that can be achieved through the public and private collaboration and continue to take steps to, to make access to credit and home buyer education available to lower and moderate income households, to support them in achieving home ownership and to becoming more financially successful. Thank you so very much and we're honored to, to be a part of this conference today and we hope that you enjoy the entirety of the conference. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited to kick off this year's conference. Uh, it's going to be a moderate, uh, at the beginning, it's going to be a fireside chat with, with our own mayor and the deputy secretary of HUD, moderated by Ms. Ali Solis, the CEO and president of Make Room Inc. USA. It's a national advocacy group that advocates on behalf of renters. Uh, they actually were partners with us two years ago in helping kick off a Colorado campaign, which uh, has been very, very successful. From a very personal note, I have to, I'm thrilled to be introducing Ali. Ali and I have known each other for about 20 years, and I've seen her work across the country, what she's done in impacting communities. She is uh, an industry leader that works with the White House, Congress, state and local policymakers, and really implementing change around affordable housing. And today her focus is, uh, with Make Room USA is really focused on helping renters in high cost markets, like Keith talked about what the cost of rents are here in Denver. Ali, prior to uh, taking over and creating Make Room USA, she was a Senior Vice President with Enterprise Community Partners doing national policy work and outreach across the country. Very impactful stuff. She started that back in the day when we both worked for Neighborhood Reinvestment Corporation. And she's just, I'm very proud of the great work she's done over the, over the years. Ali is an Inroads alumnus and a University of Maryland graduate. Go Terps. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, listen, Ali is going to introduce our panelists. Let's get this day kicked off right. Ms. Ali Solis, please join me in welcoming her. Good morning. How's everybody feeling this morning? I still have the effects of being from DC, um, adjusting to the altitude, but I am honored and uh, thrilled to be here this morning back in this wonderful city. Uh, yesterday, Deputy Secretary pa uh, Pam Patinode and I had the chance to uh, visit some of the communities and really uh, reminded me of all the important work that's going on in this, in this great community. So I'm looking forward to a thoughtful and wonderful discussion. I think the bios are in the books for uh, folks that I certainly don't need to introduce. Uh, you here have one of the most uh, incredible mayors leading the charge across the country on housing affordability, innovation, the connections to transportation. Mayor Hancock uh, not only campaigned on this issue, but uh, followed through and continues to raise the bar uh, for mayors all across the nation around making housing affordability uh, a national priority. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from him and, uh, and talking more about the vision uh, for the next few years. And Deputy Secretary uh, Pam Patinode um, is someone that I've respected and worked with for many 
many years. She is a uh, housing, uh, a lifetime houser, as we like to say. Someone who uh, really grew up uh, with housing as part of her uh, upbringing. Her family was in the development business, and then she really dedicated her life to public service. Uh, most recently, she uh, ran the um, uh, Ron Terwilliger Foundation. Uh, before that, she was with the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center, really leading the efforts around the nation's uh, first national uh, bipartisan uh, housing commission. And now, uh, in her new role as Deputy Secretary, we'll have an opportunity to hear uh, the work that she is leading uh, at HUD, which uh, is not more critical, I mean, could not be more critical than this time that we're, we're in today. So I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to the conversation. I'd ask them to please join the stage. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alex. Are we all on here? Are we live? Are we live? Pam, can you say a few Good words? Good morning, Denver. <laughs> Great. I'm not sure. All right, so I'm going to proceed with uh, the first question. I'll start with the mayor just to make sure that her uh, mic is fully working. Although I know she can, she can uh, speak loudly, so hopefully we'll be able to get it all fixed soon. So, Mr. Mayor, since taking office nearly seven years ago, you've made housing affordability a top priority of your administration. Uh, you've created several new initiatives, programs, and you know, I'd like to know, what, what do you see as your greatest housing accomplishment um, during this tenure, and how do we get other mayors, other policy leaders across the country to bring the same vitality, passion that you do to this issue? Uh, because we really need to create a, an army of supporters around this. Well, I appreciate that, Ali, and, and let me welcome Deputy Secretary uh, Pat Nile to Denver. We had a great conversation last night and uh, a great reception to kick this summit off and thank all of you for being here as well. Um, I think it is important to recognize the fact that Denver, through this entire challenge of addressing affordable housing, we have been a, a, a two-winged bird, uh, which is important. We can't fly with one wing. And I got to tell you, I applaud and celebrate City Council, uh, particularly two champions, one, Councilman Albus Brooks and Councilwoman Kanish, who have worked closely with my administration and all of our stakeholders to really advance the issues of affordable housing. I see Councilman Cashman here as well. This has been an, an all-out effort in the city of Denver to address it. But let me just tell you, you might think that the, the Affordable Housing Fund might be the one thing that we can say that's, that's the thing. Um, we're still working to perfect the, the housing fund, but let me tell you what I'm most proud of. We had to lay the foundation and raise the level of urgency in the city of Denver around affordable housing. And it started with two things. One was in 2012-13, uh, Paul Washington and I, who was the Executive Director of Economic Development at the time, sketched out this three by five initiative. 3,000 new units in five years to be built in Denver, affordable housing units. Uh, trying to, the whole goal was to reach those 3,000, by the way, which we did in four years, we surpassed the goal. But the ultimate objective goal was really about raising the level of awareness in the city of Denver. And that got the attention of stakeholders, builders, developers, all the residents in Denver, and, and in terms of the, the sense of urgency around affordable housing. And the second one was to convene um, a group of stakeholders in the city of Denver to write our five-year housing plan, uh, housing and inclusive Denver. Um, I got to tell you, that is our blueprint. So we wanted to lay the foundation of awareness and to create the foundation or strengthen that foundation by creating a blueprint on how we would proceed to begin to address the issues and challenges and opportunities around affordable housing in Denver. Fantastic, and I'm glad that you mentioned the City Council because uh, we really do need this ecosystem that's all working together. And here you have a very strong council that too is committed to this issue, so thanks for uh, that reminder. Um, Deputy Secretary Pat Node, great to see you. Um, HUD has existed for more than 50 years, and yet Americans continue to struggle to find a home that they can afford. The Secretary has laid out a four-year strategic plan and a vision, a framework that envisions American communities and reimagines the way that HUD works. What are the top priorities uh, that this administration is focusing on to accomplish this? And what are the areas that you're leading on? Uh, if, if I can just congratulate the mayor, not only do you have a wonderful housing plan, sir, you're seeing it 
it, it come to life, and that is really impressive. A lot of cities have plans, but you're executing, and the implementation has been superb so far. So, and Allie, thank, thank you. you for, Allie, there's nobody more passionate about affordable housing in America than Allie Solis, so thank you for that continued commitment. So uh, this is just the start of my ninth month back at HUD, although this is my fourth tour of duty, and when I added up the number of years, it was kind of frightening how many years of my career I've actually been at HUD. But when the secretary arrived just a few months uh, before I arrived at HUD, he came into this job as uh, a gentleman that had spent his, his life saving lives, and the secretary's focus is solely on people. So he came about the job in a very different way. So when I talk about HUD's vision, it's his vision, and my job is to help implement that vision. So the secretary came to HUD and said, you know, how do we measure success? And the secretary's uh, response to that was, I don't think we should measure success by how many people we house. We need to measure success by how many people we help to move, you know, to, to break this generational cycle of poverty, to help people move to self-sufficiency, and that the government should get out of the way. So the secretary has a new paradigm. It's a new day at HUD. Um, when we talk about the federal government's role in housing, we don't really do anything. We're the catalyst. All the real work is done by the folks in this audience, at the city, the local level, um, and, and sometimes the state. I'd love to see the states more involved. So the secretary's focus on individuals and, and helping people achieve self-sufficiency, he is placing a great deal of emphasis on creating what he calls the Envision Centers. And hopefully next month, early next month, you will see the first Envision Center unveiled in his hometown in Detroit. And what the secretary wants to do is to bring housing healthcare, education, economic opportunity, uh, job training, all under one roof. And it's not a new concept, but the way the secretary is going to execute on this, I think is a very new way. So very much focus on individuals. We absolutely acknowledge that there are people that will always need our help. They're you know, our most vulnerable citizens. There's an enormous focus on homelessness. The secretary arrived. Unfortunately, we are seeing trends that are very disturbing in homelessness. We're actually seeing for the first time a rise in homelessness in very high cost cities, particularly on the coast. So homelessness is a, a huge priority. And then on, what I'm so pleased to see is that we are looking at housing in a balanced way. And this is something I've worked on for the last decade. That this nation, we really don't have a national housing policy, but a housing policy should be balanced. We need to focus on rental opportunities and home ownership. So one of the first actions that the administration did on the home ownership side was to preserve the uh, MMIF fund, the Mortgage Mutual Insurance Fund. As you know, we don't lend the money. The lenders on the audience lend the money. We insure uh, the homeowners, the, the, the lenders uh, in the case of default. So that was a really critically important action the department took. If we had not done that, we would have dropped below our 2% minimum capital. And that would have jeopardized the FHA fund future home buyers. So there's definitely been a balanced uh, focus on homeowners, on renters. The secretary just announced rent reform, and we can talk more about that later. And I know you've been doing a tremendous job as someone, my family's from Puerto Rico, so I'm very grateful that um, the Deputy Secretary has been leading the disaster recovery work. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that, but just for folks that don't know, uh, the HUD budget overall is about $42 billion, and the funding that has been distributed uh, because of these tragic disasters is over $35, million, uh, $35 billion as well. So, you know, we have an opportunity, sadly, as a country, we're going to continue to see challenges like natural disasters, how we plan for them how we execute them, how we learn uh, from our successes, I think is really important. So hopefully we'll spend some time on that. Uh, but back to you, Mr. Mayor. In 2016, I had the privilege of uh, working with many of the tremendous local leaders here um, to help your, uh, your vision for creating the first uh, local trust fund. You mentioned that. Um, I know it was wonderful to see that um, there's a new proposal now to expand that fund. And also, this new innovative approach to really uh, include 100 105 million, uh, you know, sort of a bond approach uh, with the Denver Housing Authority. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we had a chance to see some of the work, and I will say, as someone that has worked for a long time in many cities across the country, the work that is being done here in partnership with the city and this housing authority uh, is not just innovative, it is comprehensive, and it should be a model that the rest of the nation looks at. So I'd love to hear from you. What would you do with this new model if approved, and what would success look like to you? I appreciate it. First of all, I think it's important to, to note that 
There have been many people and organizations in this audience who have worked tirelessly on the issue of affordable housing. Uh, way before I became, I came into office, and um, whether it's Kevin Marchman, who was uh, director of Denver Housing Authority, Del Norte, Northeast Denver Housing, New Said, uh, many George Thorne, many of the stakeholders who are here who have worked tirelessly on this issue over the decades in the city in the city of Denver. One of the things that uh, you know the deputy secretary and I talked about last night is we realized we both started our careers in public housing, mm -hmm. and uh, Kevin Marchman hired me right out of college at age 24 to work at Denver Housing Authority. I did that for about four years, and it brought an understanding and the real of, of the real power I think that. Um, uh, public housing authorities can play in helping to address this issue of affordable housing. You had the city trying to address this issue by itself. And while I was a, a city council president, I met with uh, Mayor Hickenlooper at the time and I said to him, why aren't we letting or working with Denver Housing Authority on this issue? And then I become mayor and you almost forget those are the values that you, you talked about and espoused and pushed for. And then one day the light went on and I'm like, wait a minute. Why aren't we reaching out to DHA as an integral partner? And so I get Ishmael Guerrero on the phone and he and I had a long conversation about the fact that you are the natural partner to step up and to be with us on this deal. And it worked out well. And I want to thank all the, the attorneys and partners who helped for moving this forward. When it becomes a reality coming through city council in the next couple of weeks, I suspect we will be able to double the amount of uh, housing we can bring online in the next three to five years from 3,000 to 6,400. My guess is we'll probably do more than that just based on how we've been able to exceed the commitments or goals the city has had under uh, affordable housing. What success will look like is we meet all of the goals that we've laid out, 3,000 or 6,400 units versus 3,000 over the next five years, um, that we are able to excite and to even do even some more things around the city of Denver in terms of land trusts, in terms of partnering with developers, whatever we can do to help create even more units as we go forward, and of course stabilize the affordable housing market with more permanency uh, of these units in our city. We do have, and I'll say this now, a lot of units that are under our affordable housing covenants today that are coming up in terms of the end of their term. And so it's going to be strategically important to us to partner with those who buy or help us to extend the preservation of those units in our marketplace. It would be a tragedy if we lost those units as part of our inventory. And so we have to be proactive now to move in with some of these resources to help preserve those units in our inventory. Yeah, and I'm going to come back to preservation. I think that's a critically important uh, issue, especially as we're seeing uh, neighborhoods uh, continue to prosper, but also gentrify and force some, uh, you know, some of the folks that have lived there for many years out. Right. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But Deputy Secretary, in an, you know, in order to address this growing and evolving housing crisis, <coughs> we need new, bold, creative approaches. Uh, we need public-private partnerships. You know, sadly, we're starting to see some of the largest philanthropic organizations that have traditionally focused on and funded housing mm -hmm. um, stepping away from that commitment. Uh, and yet, the good news is we're starting to see others really step in. Organizations, local organizations like the Denver Health Foundation and many others are now seeing the importance of connecting these uh, health and housing, for example, ideas. So we're, ha we're happy about that, but we continue to need new innovation. So Deputy Secretary, what role do you think um, innovation, private sector collaboration and technology can play in helping us maybe think about uh, how we solve this in new ways? So Ali and I started talking about this uh, last night, and you know, I think about innovation and technology. Is my mic on? Yeah, I think he's going you, in now. Can you hear me okay out there? Uh, no. You cannot hear? Okay. You're going to give me a hand while he gets going in and out. So critically important. I think we lost a lot of momentum during the financial crisis. We had begun to get innovation. She's, yeah. So they've, they've lost uh, some momentum during the financial crisis that they're trying to, to uh, get back. And uh, thank you. Thank you for running. That was <laughs> good job. There is nothing that HUD team won't do. That's right. Caitlin <laughs> Thompson, is this microphone on? It was on. Did you? Okay, this mic's not on. I, I, I can be a translator. Go ahead. <laughs> I have never been accused of being quiet, so I will try to speak loudly. So innovation. My, my family was in the, uh, my family continues to be in the home building business. And I have to say that home building has one. not changed so all that much in the last few years. Right. The way we administer the housing programs has not changed all that much. It's on. Since I graduated. No, it's not on. No, it's not. 
think it's quite the, the comedy message. of errors. Okay. Uh, the way that we administer our rental housing programs have not changed all that much. So the way that uh, HUD administers uh, their rental programs really haven't changed that much uh, in the many decades that she's been doing this work. I certainly have a decade head go. start on this wonderful mayor sitting over here to my left, but that's a long time ago that I entered uh, into this field. And the Section 8 program pretty much is being administered the same way. So we need to provide our local communities, public housing authorities with greater flexibility. The innovation is not going to happen at the federal level. It's not going to come from Washington, D.C. It's going to come from the, you know, the great minds that are gathered here today. I think it is absolutely um, imperative that we get employers on board. We need to talk about the cost of inaction. I had an opportunity to talk to one of your local uh, radio hosts this morning. Employers were beginning to get it mm -hmm. before 2008, mm -hmm. and then everybody was just struggling to, you know, to keep their head above water. So I think now that you know you have this booming economy here in Denver, we really need to tell the story, and by by attracting new partners, I think we will see innovation, but it's, it, it is absolutely time uh, for um, the federal government to get out of the way, you know, provide the funding that we can, but to allow the uh, flexibility at the local level so that innovation will begin to occur. Thank you for that, and um, I, I think that's right. We all have an important role to play. Mr. Mayor, you talked about uh, stabilizing residents, and, and uh, Deputy Secretary talked about the homeless epidemic, which sadly uh, we're starting to see rise and see it become not just an issue for, um, for individuals, but really for families, yeah. uh, and no more epic than in places like Los Angeles, where we have really an epidemic. Can you share a little bit about your vision? I know that this is something you've you know, cared deeply about. Uh, it's also something that we'll be talking about at a break breakout session, but how do you see us moving the needle on this goal? I mean, we were able to do it for veterans as a nation, but how do we think about this more globally around the homelessness issue? Well, I think one is to look at the issue similar to how you look at, you know, many cities have looked at veterans. And it is not, you know, it's important for us, and I, I know this matter, the Deputy Secretary went there as well, the Secretary is talking about this as a value. We have to acknowledge the connected tissue uh, of all these other assorted issues that contribute to the ultimate uh, vision of seeing someone chronically homeless on our streets, mental health, uh, drug and alcohol addiction. Um, obviously there are issues, familial uh, challenges that people deal with, but ultimately those who have familial challenges, those who have uh, episodic moments in their lives, they've lost a job, a divorce, or death of a loved one that rendered them homeless, those typically are temporarily homeless and you usually don't see them. That's right. um, the ones that we deal with, uh, or at least we see every day, um, uh, and we, that people are responding to, typically there's something that is much more uh, deeper that is contributing to their chronic homelessness in the city. And so we have to take that broad stance and broad approach to addressing it with myriad of tools. And so let's not minimize uh, the thought in that it's just about a roof, although a roof over their head is, is first priority. But if we think a roof will just be all that's needed for someone who is, has a mental health impairment, um, we'll, we'll continue to this very expensive cycle. Um, that we have uh, in the issue, around the issue of homelessness. So the city of Denver has taken this very broad approach, it's very methodical, it's very time consuming, and very resource intensive. It costs a lot of money to address the issues of homelessness in cities all over this country. And for every person you, we see who is homeless, there is a different story and a different approach that has to be taken for them. And we saw a cookie cutter approach does not work, it's not effective, we've done that as a society. We have to be willing to address not only housing, but we have to wrap them with the appropriate services that meets them where they are and helps address their, their challenges, whatever it may, those challenges may be. I think that's a great point. And just to say, I don't know if this is, now, now, now it's mine. Sure time. turn. All right, because I can speak loudly. Mm. Uh, I didn't, what, what, you know, just to, I just haven't said anything. Point, make, uh, or, or sort of, you know, emphasize. Okay, great. Great. All right. See, we're testing it out. The rest of the day, it's going to run so smooth, you have no idea. Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, you, know, the, the, you, you mentioned the cost. And the one thing I would say that we don't focus on enough is what is it costing us as a country, the cost of inaction? 
right. when the dose of the problem is so big, and yet the resources are not there to really, you know, address the need. So okay, I appreciate so you because I think we need to be more honest about what it's going to take for us to solve this problem, but then what it's costing us as a society by not addressing this. Yeah, and, and Ali, let me just say this, not to belabor it, but it's not just in dollar terms, right? It's the psych psychological uh, uh, scars of an entire community. It is um, the, the children that are left behind, that struggle, children uh, on our streets. The fastest growing homeless population in Denver in terms of new people entering into our services are elderly women. And, and, and you know, all of us who have uh, mothers, aunts, you know, grandmothers, uh, just the, 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 the thought of one of them being homeless on our streets and being vulnerable. Uh, but anyone, every individual homeless person is a tragedy. It is a market failure that, we, as a society, we've got to figure out how to correct and, and, and move in with the right plans and strategies to address it. That's great. Um, so, Deputy Secretary, we recently just saw uh, new resources coming in with the omnibus uh, spending bill, the large spending bill that Congress passed earlier this year, and the tax reform bills, uh, which provided increased funding for some critical housing programs, programs like the housing credit, which uh, is the largest you know, federal resource we have now for developing uh, housing that's affordable. But there's also new programs like the Opportunity Zone. Mm. Can you say a little bit more about what role HUD might play, and then, you know, how we think about with the new um, incentives that are coming from the federal government, you know, how do we ensure that as we're bringing new resources to more distressed communities, we are also making sure that uh, those families can stay. So back to the preservation issue. But say a little bit about the, the omnibus and the opportunity. So we were so excited to see the opportunity zones and excited about the, the um, the possibility of it being a game changer in affordable housing. I think, you know, when we were out in, in Sun Valley yesterday, that has uh, been designated as a opportunity zone here in Denver. So it's going to be an opportunity to attract private investment, private capital uh, into that area. What we don't know, we don't know the rules of the road yet. It's actually not a HUD program. It's not a program at all. It's a tax incentive. That, that Treasury's running, but I can tell you that my boss, Secretary Carson, is so excited about it. He talks about opportunity zones all day long. He's on the phone constantly trying to talk to the experts, the nation's experts on tax credits, and thankfully we have over three decades of experience with the tax credit program. So there are folks out there that are laser focused on will this actually benefit residential uh, rental housing, but we certainly know areas that um, it is going to benefit on, um, we, we know enough about the program to know it's gonna have an impact. What we're waiting for is for the IRS to issue the guidelines, and I'm told that they will be out by the summer, which is in government terms, lightning speed. Um, one of the other areas I want to talk about though that is really, really important that we don't overlook, regulatory barriers. The President's, one of his first actions was to issue an executive order on regulatory barriers at the federal level. We went out for public comment, we asked the public, our partners, our stakeholders, what are we doing at HUD that's getting in the way uh, of you doing your jobs? I think that's making a difference. We've identified all kinds of things that we can fix. But at the local level, we need to identify regulatory barriers. So HUD is about to announce a, a new initiative. It's not brand new. It's relaunching of an initiative uh, that was very effective working with the mayors. And I did ask Mayor Hancock if he would help us uh, educate other mayors and get them as excited as he is. I mean, the, the depth of knowledge that you have in this area is so impressive. Uh, th this very sad statistic about the, the fastest growing homeless population, these elderly women, I had never heard that before. So I think, you know, having that story told. But we need to get states also involved in that initiative. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Regulatory barriers are a big issue, as is figuring out new ways to uh, combat nimbyism, right? This movement afoot. Um, and I think the uh, American Communities, America's Communities Initiative, which is looking at what the federal government can do, but also um, helping mayors, you know, and, and local leaders and state governments reward uh, and actually incentivize uh, affordable housing and sort of as a way to combat some of the, the nimbyism that we're seeing across the country around local zoning. And, and, and local issues. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you talked about uh, preservation as a big priority of yours. And obviously with almost 2,200 um, you know, apartment homes uh, that are currently income restricted, 
likely uh, potentially falling out of the, the, the affordable housing stock over the next five years. And certainly there are countless you know, market rate affordable housing units that are being sold, upgraded, and priced way out of reach. Um, this is a story that we're seeing in many markets across the country. Talk a little bit about your preservation strategy and what stakeholders in this room can do to play a role um, and, and really uh, helping us find new ways to foster preservation. Thank you, Ali. One of the first things is we have to make sure that our, uh, as we have experienced here in Denver, uh, Madam Deputy Secretary, a challenge with regards to our compliance program in Denver, where we found, um, you know, there's some cracks in there where people are transferring properties unbeknownst to them. They're buying properties um, that are that are deed restricted, and so one of the things that we have to do as a state is to make sure and demand that the state, the city, but the entire industry is aware, focused, and is paying attention to these deeds on these uh, on these covenants, and that they, these covenants on the deeds, excuse me, and they transfer appropriately, and that buyers and sellers are reminded and made aware of, of uh, these restrictions as they, they transfer property. So that's first and foremost, stay true, and we're beefing up our team at OED um, um, to make sure that we stay on top of this, because we have had failures, as we have been seen reported in Denver. So that, that's, that's important. Two, we have to be proactive. We know the terms of these units coming up, uh, and we have to begin before they become up to figure out how we can move uh, to extend uh, or to be where as they come available that we're moving in to um, get first right of opportunity on, on these units. I am proud to have stand with, stood with City Council as they uh, created the preservation ordinance in the city of Denver, in a lot of cases creating that first right of refusal if the city of Denver invested in these properties um, so that we can stand in position and make sure that we extend the preservation. Uh, but I got to tell you, the issue of uh, education awareness is critical. The issue of proactiveness or the opportunity around proactiveness is critical. Uh, and with all of the folks in this room, um, making sure that as we are aware of not only units that are coming up, but uh, that, that may be part of your uh, developments. Uh, I see Zocalo over here as well. Uh, but also, um, where there are opportunities where we can purchase uh, units that may be market rate and, and, and create the opportunity for new units that we can preserve going forward. So those are the things I think that we can all play a role in terms of awareness and being proactive in, in the marketplace. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, Denver, like many metro areas, is booming. And as a result, obviously, there's a, a huge need for more affordable and workforce homes. But one of the questions I wanted to talk about a little bit was you have a new proposal around uh, rent reform. So you know how we think about uh, making it easier for uh, developers and others to use HUD programs more effectively and efficiently. Uh, there was bipartisan legislation that was passed by Congress last year, as you know, the housing opportunity through modernization. Act. Um, how is HUD soliciting feedback on this proposal that you've put out, which I understand to be a, a discussion draft, a working document uh, that you're looking for feedback on with, res with respect to the rent uh, reform proposals that we've heard about in the news? So as Ali said, it is definitely a, uh, a working draft. The rent reform proposal that uh, was recently uh, released by the Secretary of HUD was done in conjunction with the FY19 budget. So with, you know, in this, in this fiscally constrained environment, just keep in mind that this was done at the same time. Fast forward, Omnibus, we're looking at, at more money in, in our budget right now. That's not a promise forever, but we did have a two-year budget uh, deal. So what's important, I think, to talk about in the rent reform, um, many of you know Milan Ozdenik. He's been at HUD for over three decades. But he, he said to me, just remember it this way. It's PTSD. Now i got to explain what that is, because that's not the greatest acronym. But what we're looking at in rent reform is the P, predictable. You know, the program, you know, the way the program's been administered now for decades, it's complicated. Uh, the federal budget, the investment in, in housing is not always predictable, you know, with budget. So that is a, a, a key principle in it. Transparent, very complex to understand the way that we administer our rental programs and how our partners administer them. 
the S stands for simple. The secretary, that's across the board. He wants to see all HUD programs simplified. That was somewhat mind-blowing to him when he came in to see how complex they were. And then finally, the D for dignified. You know, we require seniors to come to the table and really pour their hearts out. And even though it's been 35 years since I administered the Section 8 uh, rental program, this is even before the voucher program, I had such a hard time trying to understand, you know, with all these deductions. So that was what was behind going to the gross rent. And again, making sure that there's no increase on, on seniors and disabled. But I think those are, you know, the four overlying principles of what we're looking at with rent reform. And it is very much a conversation. We'll be doing a tremendous amount of stakeholder outreach in the months to come. Thank you, and I'm glad to hear that because often we see things in the news that really highlight just one aspect. I would be remiss as a, someone that represents, uh, that's with an organization that focuses on renters who, one in four of which are having to pay more than half their income to rent, that whatever the proposal looks like at the end of the day, we're not uh, really making it harder for the most vulnerable in our country to be able to stay uh, housed. Uh, for those, you know, uh, most vulnerable, we, when we think about trade-offs that we have to make in our lives, when you're, when you're paying 70% of your your income on rent or 80% as hundreds and hundreds of people are in this country even a small increase means you might not be able to pay for your medicine or, or other medical you know other critical uh, life needs so I just I think it's important and it's also uh, important for all of you I mean this is an open invitation to, to uh, engage with um, deputy secretary and others around these policies we, you know they are uh, they listen to the comments that they receive so uh, it's upon us as an industry as well to give feedback constructive thoughtful feedback on how we can make these programs work more efficiently and effectively. So thanks for that. Um, you know, Mr. Mayor, you know, you talked a little bit about the American dream of home ownership. Uh, it's certainly more challenging uh, than ever in the past. And also, households are making, you know, different uh, decisions for their lives in terms of when they want to uh, become homeowners. Uh, and Pam mentioned, as a nation, we've not necessarily always had balanced housing policy, right? We've had a policy that absolutely supports higher income homeowners. So, but it is important. We want to make sure people have a pathway uh, to home ownership should they choose that. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in that regard. Sure. One of the things that, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, um, not only coming from Denver Housing Authority, but my background at the Urban League, where we worked with the city and other stakeholders to do financial education, which is an uh, extremely powerful uh, um, skill uh, to know how to navigate and prepare oneself and their family for home ownership, as well as sustainability, which is a big issue in America uh, today. One of the areas that we're very proud of is we created these financial empowerment um, uh, offices or centers around the city of Denver. And in those offices or centers, there are coaches that help individuals who walk through the door. And we have anywhere from folks who are 30% AMI below or all the way up through 120% AMI who are walking through the door, getting the uh, benefits of financial coaching in those centers and, and helping to understand, one, to abate debt, which is very important, uh, and if you want to own property at some point, and two, how do you prepare yourself for, for home ownership? And uh, so those financial centers are very, very successful. They've helped abate millions of dollars in debt and have helped position people from homelessness to home ownership. And we have some successful stories where we found residents living in their cars. Today, two years later, they are homeowners. Uh, and that, that to me is a powerful, powerful uh, uh, anecdote, story, right? Um, and then the other thing, and I'll finish on this, is the Metro Mortgage Assistance Program, which has, I can't remember the exact figure in terms of the number of dollars that we have meted out as a metropolitan region through this program that the city of Denver administers. But I can tell you that today, through our down payment assistance program, using those uh, bonds uh, issued through the Metro uh, Housing Assistance Program, 1,400 families have, been, have become homeowners as a result. And so there's a lot of effort to continue to push for uh, affordable home ownership in the city of Denver. And as part of our affordable housing uh, fund, we also include in their DOP help individuals become homeowners. So it's not just all a rental. So I think we're running out of time, but I'm going to take another two minutes since we lost it because of the microphone situation. Uh, 
a couple of things I just wanted to say. You know, we're um, approaching midterm elections uh, here in November, and um, I think it's really important that as we think about how we build both bipartisan support for this issue, we view housing as a nonpartisan issue, right? Everybody needs a home uh, in order to access opportunity. One of the things Make Room really focuses on is how we empower lower-income renters through the power of technology to make it easier for them to connect with their policy leaders. Uh, I'd love to hear from you all as we wrap up kind of your big um, push, and I'd ask uh, for each of you to give a commitment that you will use, uh, as I know you do, Deputy Secretary, when you're talking, and Mayor Hancock, in your broader um, work at the national level through the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities, you know, what are some ways that we can start to make this issue uh, much more prominent, uh, a leading issue within the uh, town halls and during our local elections that are coming up, and what can we all do as a community to really raise the voice and the attention to this issue. So uh, I'll turn to Deputy Secretary first. So I think one of the ways to do this is to attend town halls. You know, when they have the debates and they have live audiences, show up for these events. Connect it to everything. If they're talking about infrastructure, remind them that infrastructure is housing. If they're talking about healthcare, healthcare policy impacts housing policy and vice versa. I did this, I think, very effectively during the 2016 uh, presidential primaries in my home state of New Hampshire. Very easy to do in that state because at any on any given day you could have five or six presidential candidates and literally a dozen town halls. So I just showed up. I spent an entire uh, summer, four months. Uh, chasing presidential candidates on both sides of the aisle and convincing them that housing had to be part of their platform. But Mr. Mayor, it is part of your platform. I think it's part of your DNA. I mean, it's so important to you. And I think that having mayors, you know, you're really a role model that we um, convince folks that this is really, you're dedicating a, an entire morning. Last night we were with you talking about housing. Uh, that it is, it's part of their jobs as an elected official, regardless if they're at the you know mayoral level, the governor, um, members of the House of Representatives, the United States Senate. Housing is important. It's a platform that we live our lives from. So, uh, Ali's campaign, make room. I think that you know sharing best practices are all really important. I want to thank you again, Deputy Secretary, for being here. Your presence is powerful and it's important that from Washington all the way to Denver, Colorado, we have someone who understands the issue, the critical issue of affordable housing and housing for all. Because the reality is, is that every one of us in this room desires affordable housing. Right? Um, it's relative, it's what we can afford and what we can comfortably house our family and take care of them. So let me say this, Denver has a critical, uh, this midterm is critical for Denver, where our governor's office is up for off election. And the reality is you ask what we can all do in this room, simply show up. And if you sit there and you listen to the platforms of these individuals who are running for office, running for governor, and they get halfway through a debate and don't talk about affordable housing as a priority, find another candidate to support. Um, because the issue of affordable housing is critical all throughout the state of Colorado. At one point, no state was growing as fast as Colorado. At one point in, this, in the last five years, there wasn't a state whose housing costs were escalating as fast as Colorado. And no one should be running for Colorado for the state house uh, without understanding that affordable housing is critical to the connected tissue of humanity in the state of Colorado. And so as I've sat with these candidates, I'm listening for them talking about the issues of housing, affordable housing, mobility, and education, how we pay our teachers, how we reward uh, good educational systems, their willingness to put resources behind it and really be bold in their policies. Uh, and so we have a chance, I think, to listen and to elect the next governor and members of the state, state uh, legislature who get it. And the last thing I'll say is listen for those who have some, as the Deputy Secretary pointed out, connection to the most vulnerable in our city through their life, through their experience, through their work. Um, there's nothing like sitting at a table talking about affordable housing and saying, yep, I've been there. I get it. And we have to move as policymakers to make decisions that help lift those who are most vulnerable in our cities and, our, and throughout the state of Colorado. 
thank you for those powerful remarks. Uh, and I think it's an important point. We're here today talking about Denver, but this is a regional issue across the country. This is impacting rural communities, small towns. I was just in Erie, Pennsylvania a few months ago uh, meeting with a family there. So housing and the challenges that we're facing as a nation are not just coastal market problems, right? And so I think we all have a responsibility and an opportunity to raise our voices, to show up, uh, participate, and uh, work together to make this a national priority. That's the only way we're going to address it. I am uh, honored to have been here with our panelists. I want to thank uh, Mayor Hancock for his leadership here in the region and across the nation, showing examples of what can be done if you've got the will to make it so, and the Deputy Secretary who uh, has dedicated her life to this issue and is working hard at HUD to make it a, a stronger agency, to make the programs more efficient, and make it easier for folks in this room to do their job. So uh, let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're very fortunate to have uh, get a national perspective, a local perspective, and a regional perspective on what, what's not only impacting Denver and the metro area, but cities across the country. There's high cost cities across the country that are experiencing this. I do have to say, one of the things, if you've ever done much public speaking in front of crowds, one thing you have control over is yourself. You don't have control over technology. The sign of a real professional is you call an audible at the line and you pass the microphone around. So congratulations to you all for, for calling the audible. Uh, we're in for a real treat on this next panel of national experts that will follow up on, on that discussion, talking about preservation, production, and policy at both the national and the local level from a nonprofit and a private perspective. I think we're, we're thrilled. And the moderator is uh, Marion McFadden. Marion is the vice president at Enterprise Community Partners. She leads a team doing research and advocacy to support affordable housing and community development nationally. I have to give a big shout out to Enterprise Community Partners. They led the effort nationally to uh, preserve and expand the low income housing tax credit, which all the folks that work in this field know that's critical to getting our deals done. I must also give a shout out to our state legislature and the governor for preserving and expanding our state low-income housing tax credit. That's critical for, for us to address the issues that we're, that we're looking at today and facing this city and this state. Uh, Marion just has a tremendous background. I've, I've gotten to know her over the last couple of years, and I'm, I'm thrilled, and thank you for coming out to join us today. As a moderator, uh, she's just tremendous. Her background is such that she was a former uh, Hudster herself, running CDBG home, many other programs, uh, to disaster relief for the interagency on Hurricane Sandy rebuilding. Marion holds a JD magna cum laude. For those that are non-Greek, that's with great honors. She's a smart person, and she's a wonderful person. A JD from Howard University, and a BA from Northwestern University. So with that, may I ask Marion to come up and get our, you can introduce our panel. Let's give Marion a hand, please. everyone. I heard myself louder that time, so it's a good sign. Um, it's tremendous to look out at a crowd this large. I get to speak at housing conferences around the country, and I have to say this is an incredible turnout. Uh, so props to the city of Denver on bringing you all together to this room, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm very proud to be able to work with the city of Denver. You heard uh, much and you've seen firsthand the commitment of the mayor himself. And I want to ensure you that that extends to the rest of the team working on housing. And it's been a pleasure to work with you all in the Enterprise High Cost Cities Housing Forum and in other initiatives. And so you've got the A-team. This morning, I am very pleased to be um, following up that great discussion between the mayor and the deputy secretary with some of the same themes and some of the same questions to get some different perspectives um, from our panelists. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Tony Hutchinson, who comes to us from, <coughs> excuse me, 
from Freddie Mac, where he leads government affairs. And for those of you who don't know, Freddie Mac is a government-sponsored sponsored entity which supports home ownership by buying mortgages on the private market, pooling them, and putting them back out. Uh, sorry, on the secondary market, and then putting them out on the public market as mortgage-backed securities. Uh, next to Tony, we have Mary Lee, the deputy director at PolicyLink. PolicyLink is a national nonprofit research and action institute advancing racial and economic equity. And Sarah Michelson, the policy director for the National Low Income Housing Coalition, also a national nonprofit. They're dedicated to achieving sorry, excuse me, to achieving socially just public policy that assures people with the lowest incomes have access to affordable housing. So thank you for joining us this morning. I was uh, pleasantly surprised that this year brought us so much good news on the federal front in terms of funding levels. So the omnibus funding for this year put a 10% increase in the HUD budget after that tough fight uh, that Rick mentioned to preserve the low-income housing tax credit last year. We actually got a 12.5% increase to the low-income housing tax credit and some income averaging provisions that are going to make it easier to serve the lowest income folks living in housing credit credit properties. Um, the opportunity zones were created to channel public, uh, sorry, private funds into low-income areas. So we're seeing some exciting things happen in the Congress that were unexpected. Uh, but Sarah, in the context of all these policy wins, could you let us know how, um, it, what does it mean? What do these increases mean? How are they going to affect some of the lowest income people uh, who you're fighting for and work with? What are the data telling you about the severity of the problems? Yeah, thank you so much for that opportunity to talk about this. Uh, so much of the work that we do at the national level is fueled by what the data tells us what the needs are. And if you look across the country, we've found that there's a deficit of about 7 million homes for 11 million extremely low income households. Uh, another way of looking at this is that for every 100 uh, families who are earning those lowest incomes, there are only 35 homes available for them. Uh, that means the other 65 don't have housing options that are in their uh, price range, and they're forced to spend 50, 60, 70 percent of their income on rent. It means they have less money for groceries, for medicine, for meeting their daily needs, let alone the needs that they have to invest in their futures through education and training. Um, so we're really pleased to see the positive outcome on the FY18 budget, and that's in large part because of the work that's being done at the local level through advocates. We saw an enormous new energy coming up um, this year that helped really push Congress towards making those budget deals. We had strong champions in Congress through Susan Collins and uh, Jack Reed from Rhode Island, um, all kind of coming together. Um, and I think part of that was spurred on by the President's extremely deep cuts to uh, HUD programs. Uh, we couldn't take it for granted that those programs would be funded at the level that they needed to be. Um, we would have seen otherwise um, uh, $11 billion in cuts to programs, uh, some 250,000 vouchers being lost. And this budget really sent a clear message that Congress was not interested in going along with the President's proposal, and in fact they increased it by 10 percent. Much of those resources are targeted to help people with the lowest income. So we're seeing something around the lines of 60,000 new housing vouchers come online. Many of those are targeted to help um, serve people who have disabilities. Um, but we also saw for the first time a major infusion of uh, almost a billion dollars into public housing to help repair that resource, um, which is permanently affordable uh, to people who have the lowest incomes. Is there anything else on the horizon in D.C. that you think might infuse some additional money coming this year, or is it done for, for the rest of this fiscal year? Well, this fiscal year is harder. Um, we reached that budget agreement, so it, it opened up a broad new pool of, of resources. Um, uh, the second year agreement isn't as generous, right, so it's mostly level funding. We've seen in the House bill yet again rejecting the president's budget, uh, which called for, again, deep cuts, um, again, sending a clear message that the Congress is not on board with um, decimating housing programs. Uh, for new funding coming online, we're looking forward to seeing what happens with opportunity zones as that, as that plays out. Um, and there's a continued effort um, to, to get the rest of um, 
what advocates have been pushing for in terms of the low-income housing tax credit through the Cantwell Hatch Bill. So if that's able to be added on to maybe another spending bill or some other must-pass piece of legislation, that could really um, uh, expand greatly the resources that we all have to do the work that we need to do. Great. Before we move on, anything you would add about the Farm Bill and potential for funding to get to rural communities? Yeah, absolutely. So the Farm Bill isn't usually a mechanism to getting uh, rural housing dollars out. It's focused on rural development in other places. But there is an effort underway to provide a new financing resource for manufactured housing. So much of the manufactured housing stock is um, old, is in need of repairs, and there's not a lot of current federal programs that are really targeted to serve that housing stock. Um, Senator Merkley from Oregon has introduced or will be introducing in the coming days a bill that would provide a new source of financing to help replace manufactured housing. That's an incredibly uh, important resource when it comes to rural communities um, that we haven't seen before. So that's a, a potential new avenue. Great, thank you. Uh, Tony, let's talk for a minute about duty to serve. Could you tell folks what that is and, and how uh, you're approaching your re responsibilities under duty to serve and what that's going to mean for all of us? Sure. Uh, to follow up a little bit on what uh, Sarah was saying, our duty to serve uh, rules are going to uh, have us focus on a number of different areas that, that Freddie Mac has not supported effectively over the last 10 years. It's a rule that was put out by the Federal Housing Finance Agency, our regulator. It was because of HERA that this rule has come forward, the 2008 legislation uh, that allowed us to go into conservatorship. Uh, but effectively it says that we need to do more in areas that we have not done well in in the past. Effectively, rural housing, manufactured housing, and housing affordability. Uh, there was a great comments that you made about both rural housing and manufactured housing. That's going to be an emphasis for us over the next three years, trying to figure out how do we get out in the market space and provide capital so people in those communities can have affordable housing. Uh, for us, it's been particularly hard to work in those spaces. Uh, we have not had the partnerships that we've needed on the ground. We've not had uh, the lender partnerships in those communities developed like we would so that we would be able to get out there and provide the capital. This program is providing us the ability to focus, to, to laser focus on those market areas and actually try to bring some of our knowledge and our funding to those markets. Uh, with that said, we're not trying to do it alone because we can't do it alone. We're asking all of the folks in the market space to let us know what needs to occur in order for us to facilitate better rural lending, better manufactured housing lending, better uh, uh, housing preservation. Uh, around the rural space, we're looking at financial institutions that are small, so they have capital of under $304 million. For us, that's significant because we usually deal with a bunch of the bigger entities. So we're trying to really dive into the communities and figure out who is serving the market. How do we help you develop product that can better serve the market? Uh, how, how can we better provide you with technology and expertise to serve these markets? The same in manufactured housing. Uh, prior to working at Freddie, I'll throw it out, I worked at our uh, dark sister across the, across the river, Fannie Mae, and when I was there, I worked in the manufactured housing portfolio. It was a hard business to do, and that's when it was thriving. And then it tanked prior to stick built tanking, and it tanked hard. And neither F Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae have really been back in that business in any sub substantive way. We're trying to figure out how do we get back in there. So we're doing education with folks in the community, trying to help them understand what sustainable housing is. We're doing education with the lenders of the product, trying to figure out what, what additional products and criteria can we roll out in order to facilitate more lending. And we're actually beginning to take a look at product that is not tagged to property, meaning chattel lending. Now, I don't know if you know, but a lot of the manufactured housing properties out there are not titled to the property. Uh, in the past, the GSEs, uh, government-sponsored enterprises, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, only purchased mortgages that were backed, that backed manufactured housing that was titled to the land as well. But that's only 10 to 
15% of the actual manufactured housing properties out there. Now we're taking a look at that other 80 to 85%. How do we mitigate risk and actually facilitate lending for these properties that are, or these products, this housing product that is not titled to land so that we can get more people into housing. And the other reason that that is important is not just because manufactured housing is beginning to be a, a product of importance in rural markets, but we're beginning to see that in urban areas as well. Uh, there's, there, are, there is a big movement to take a look at manufactured housing as potential infill. So you've got markets on the East Coast that are looking at that specifically to say, how do we bring in a cheaper, more affordable product that's easy for people to, to own, that's easy for us to bring into the inner city and have people live in, in it. And then you have folks who ha already have property and they need what is known as a, uh, like an in-law suite, but they don't want the in-law suite attached to the house because they don't want their kids or mom and dad walking into their house. They want them somewhere else on the property, you know, so that they, they can get full, fair warning when they're coming. But the key is, they're looking at manufactured housing as a vehicle for that. And that's also something that we're looking at. So this duty to serve that, uh, that we're being mandated over the next three years uh, to follow uh, is actually an enhancement of the work that we're already doing, our mission focus work, but it's gonna be extremely invaluable because we're watching the market change, we're walk watching the needs change, and those three areas are where a lot of the need is coming from. I look forward to having a conversation in five years or so about how you're thinking about 3D printed homes and the other <laughs> innovations we see coming down the pike, but it's, it's great to know that you're thinking about those accessory dwelling units and manufactured housing since we are seeing them pop up more and more in places where they had not been previously. Uh, how are you thinking about multifamily uh, buildings and your approach over the next couple of years? So multifamily is booming for us. I mean, we recognize that that is one of the uh, easiest forms of affordable housing. Uh, over the past, we've really focused on home ownerships of single family dwellings. But one of the things that we were told that we were missing uh, is how do we provide affordable housing uh, for individuals to start the process of home ownership? And that means in the rental space, allow them to save money or have affordable housing so that they can save the money to then make that next step into home ownership. So we're look our multifamily focus is really focused on affordable housing so that we can that can be the foundation for folks moving along the path of home ownership. Uh, that's the way we're going to focus on it moving forward. Even with our single family rentals, if you take a look at that, all of that is focused on trying to maintain some level of affordability in the market space. We're not doing any single family rentals or any major multifamily deals that do not have a, a affordability component associated with it. Uh, that is our focus and that will be our focus moving forward. Uh, we've, we've sat down and we've spoken with our regulator about this. They think that is a great approach to take. But more importantly, we've spoken to a lot of the stakeholders that we have in the marketplace. One of the things that we hope that everyone in this room uh, has noticed about us, especially if you do business with us, if you don't, hopefully you will reach out to us and, and start sharing information. And you'll see uh, our, our attention to your information. Uh, we look at what we're doing more as a partnership with the communities and the advocates out there. We recognize that we're not on the front lines, it is you all. So what you tell us is required is what we're gonna to utilize to move forward. Uh, so we're hoping that we're listening better and we're actually innovating based on what we're getting, the feedback that we're getting from the community. So that's in both multifamily and single family. Great, very happy to hear that. Tactically, what does that mean? How do folks share their thoughts? Uh, so there are a number of ways. Uh, we're open on our, on our webpage. There are ways for you to share directly with the company your thoughts, either on the multifamily side or the single family side. Uh, there is a web page that is associated for, that is built for housing advocates, uh, folks who uh, deal with real estate professionals, folks who deal with housing counselors and loan officers. And within those pages, there is an area for comment. Uh, and those comments are read, processed, and distributed through the company. And I know that for a fact, because with two of those, housing counselors and real estate professionals, I get those directly. So I'm able to respond directly to communities and also get the answers that you need from our organization and then place you 
in contact with the appropriate experts in the company to begin to develop the products or the processes that you believe are, are necessary in order to move forward. Uh, but that's the new commitment that Freddie Mac has been making to the marketplace and our partners in the marketplace, to listen, to try to implement on the ground uh, product and processes that will affect people near immediate, as opposed to taking two, three, four, five years to get to that place. Thank you. Uh, Mary, I'm going to have a bunch of questions for you, but before we go there, I just wanted to ask uh, one more uh, at the national level for you, Sarah. Uh, as as we heard on the panel this morning, making the connection between housing and all of the related issues is critically important. Could you talk about some of the efforts the National Low Income Housing Coalition has been doing to reach out to other partners to help them understand and make that connection? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we've come to the real, I'm part of um, um, the, when we started off this year, we were thinking, we need to change what we're doing because if we talk about housing only among housers, we're not going to be able to achieve and really move the dial where it needs to go. And so with the um, partners like Make Room and um, Children's Health Watch and many other groups, we've formed Opportunity Starts at Home. It's a multi-sector campaign that brings together some of the top national organizations that are focused on healthcare, on education, on uh, civil rights, on on uh, economic mobility issues, um, bringing them all to the table to essentially convert them or help them advocate for housing, affordable housing too. And part of this is because the data is in. We know that housing is a great outcome in and of itself, but it's also a platform for um, many of the other things that we want people to be able to achieve. So there's lots of evidence that shows that when people are able to move to areas of opportunity and live in a stable, affordable home, um, they have a 31% increase in their in their annual earnings. They their children are more likely to graduate from high school, more likely to attend college. Um, people have better health outcomes, less likely to have chronic illnesses, um, and we're seeing a, a rise of um, educators and health professionals and others who are seeing that the lack of affordable housing is really having a major impact in their ability to achieve what they want to accomplish. So, we're hearing from teachers who are saying that. Kids who are um, living in unstable housing are frequently moving from school district from, to school district. That undermines their ability to learn, but also um, makes it harder to teach in the classroom. We're also hearing from health professionals who say they can't focus as much as they want to on the preventative health side if people don't have enough money to spend on healthy food and medicines. And so we're really pleased to see all of these national organizations coming together um, to, to help move the dial forward when it comes to uh, advocating for investments at the federal level for affordable housing. If you all haven't seen those materials, I'd encourage you to take a look at the National Low Income Housing Coalition's website. Uh, we also have materials on the Enterprise Community Partners website, which we designed to make helpful for people who are in the day-to-day -day grind trying to make the connections. So uh, really, congratulations to you, Sarah, on the work that you guys are doing. Um, we're doing uh, related work under sim similar under the same funding initiative, uh, because we think that this is really the way that we're going to get more money to try to make some dent on the scale of the challenge that we're all facing. We've done a lot of research into what doesn't work, and we know that um, talking about a crisis has not been enough to get it done. So we're pivoting away from talking about a crisis and talking about the great things that happen in communities and in lives. Um, and that means approaching each individual person by nesting our priorities within their priorities. So it may, be, may mean talking about housing as infrastructure, housing as jobs, housing as education. So. I uh, just wanted to make sure everyone knew that those tools are available and hope that you'll use them. Mary, with no further ado, please tell us about PolicyLink's anti-displacement policy network, the work you're doing in Denver, and how you're helping to guide a conversation as the nation moves to a majority-minority 
nation and how we really should be thinking about equity and what we practically can be doing. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone this morning and want to lift up a couple of things that have been said already and emphasize why PolicyLink and other organizations are looking so specifically at this question of displacement. I think a lot of the conversation this morning, and rightfully so, has been about production of new units and preservation of existing units and preservation of existing prices, of cost of those units to the property owners, to the, to the tenants. But our anti-displacement network really is a focus on the people, and that often gets lost in our conversations about housers. It's also a focus, to your point about um, needing a narrative that's slightly different or a broadening from uh, just talking to housers, it's looking at how local government and uh, people working in their cities, in their communities and neighborhoods are experiencing this problem. Make no mistake, and I think Ali said it in the prior panel, this is a national problem. It is not just impacting what are typically thought of as hot markets. It's not just happening on the coast. It's not just happening in big cities. Um, it isn't equally distributed, but it is popping up in lots of places where people might not have anticipated or may not be aware of it. And I have to confess, um, PolicyLink is a national organization. Our headquarters is in Oakland. We have an office in New York and one in D.C. But I work out of Los Angeles, so this is a very personal issue for me. I've been watching what is the hottest of hot markets happen and unfold with uh, alarm as we've seen our communities dispersed in ways that I don't think anyone anticipated or predicted uh, even just a couple of years ago. And it moves around the process and the phenomenon of displacement has jumped uh, boundaries and, and segments of the city. So I often tell people to look at LA as a cautionary tale of what happens if you kick the can down the road when it comes to policy making, when it comes to this kind of collaborative activity, I think, that we need to see. So with that as a backdrop, PolicyLink did shape and just recently launched an anti-displacement network. The purpose of it is to create a little bit of a learning community, and you have to forgive me because I, I don't want to leave anything out, and I don't particularly want to leave out the names of the cities who uh, we've been able to invite to join us in this process. Um, but with generous funding from some wonderful partners, including the Kresge Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase and Ford, have to, have to do the commercial, uh, and with partners like the Right to the City, we've been able to launch an initiative with several cities, and I want to name them, Portland, Oregon, San Jose, California, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Austin, Texas, the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, um, uh, uh, Nashville, Buffalo, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Denver. And we're thrilled because of the breadth of these cities to see them come together to really form a learning community. That's the purpose of our anti-displacement network, to uh, really see low-income tenants and communities of color who are experiencing the increases in housing insecurity and are living um, in real vulnerability to displacement in these particular cities. We want for the learning community to come together to increase their own knowledge, their own skills, and to really build and develop um, effective strategies that will prevent displacement, that will increase the capacity to utilize data, collect it and utilize it, that will generate public support, because I think we've all been talking about that this morning as well. Um, and more than anything, to be able to enhance the political voice and power of the impacted communities. And doing that, in our view, is a real good way to create a national impact. I just want to say a couple more things because I think what we want to do with this community is to get the cities to learn from each other what's working, what's not working, what sorts of approaches help them enhance and advance policy. We all know how unique that can be. It's, it's specific to the local community that you're working in, but sometimes you can get a tip from one city about what worked to change a politician's mind, to change a community's mind, and share it. 
So that kind of peer learning is really going to be a big key. Uh, the kinds of things that we're anticipating folks will look at will be how to do replacement for home units that are lost, how to protect and house people that have been displaced, uh, and that includes tenant protections, including rent control and, and just cause eviction types of strategies. Uh, and we also want to pay special attention to the reentry community, um, people who are sometimes very, very difficult to house and whose needs in particular issues aren't always taken into account. Um, Real long-term goals again, tenant stabilization, community planning, and community control of land. And if you'll indulge me just one more minute, I really always have in these conversations a real drive for people to understand the context of what it is we're talking about. Because displacement is not new. And this housing imbalance of what we are seeing in places like Denver, but frankly in communities all over the country, is not new. Unfortunately, it's been a cyclical process, and low-income people and people of color are usually hurt first and worst by these strategies where market forces uh, take one community that's been isolated, that's been disinvested, and suddenly it becomes the in-it uh, neighborhood. Um, that sort of information we tend to look away from, and I think it's crucial that we keep it in mind as we're doing planning and policy making. You talked a little bit about the advantages of having a stable home environment. The flip side of that, even though it may not be the best way to uh, bring people into the conversation, but as policymakers and as people who are trying to solve this problem, we absolutely need to be aware of what's at risk. When people don't have um, uh, when, well, when people are displaced, and particularly displaced in these ways where it's involuntary, where it's, again, cyclical and sometimes a serial displacement. There are many people that you'll probably talk to in your walk about who've been displaced multiple times because of a freeway being constructed or a stadium being built or rents rising in their communities. Um, so those compromises to their health aren't just about the economic cost. They literally shorten lifespans. They literally end up exacerbating diseases that are preventable. Um, they separate families. They destroy cultures. This sort of serial displacement has severe consequences and frankly as our society moves to a place where people of color are going to be the majority. In California that happened quite some time ago where babies born today are children of color. Um, the majority of children, of babies born in California are children of color. What we're doing by failing to address displacement and failing to uh, build and sustain uh, quality, affordable housing for everybody is we're squandering the best resources that we have in our society, and that's people. So we won't profit, we won't prosper as a society unless the majority of the people in the society are prospering. That, frankly, is what's at stake in these conversations. Thank you. So I've been in this business a long time, as well as many of you in the room, decades. And something that's uh, really been noticeable to me recently is communities saying, no, thank you, don't bring your resources here. As communities feel like they've been community developed upon without a voice and an engagement, and that was certainly true through the Opportunity Zone process this year where governors had to select low-income census tracts to be eligible uh, for tax bonuses for investment and communities said, no, please, please don't come here. So I think that this process of engagement and really working with residents is exactly what we need. We're also working uh, through the SPARK initiative at Enterprise here in Denver with Mile High Connects, Low Income and Investment Funds, and many other partners on similar initiatives to make sure that we're getting the voices clear and crisp and engaged so that they're not just speaking up but influencing the policy and planning decisions that get made that will impact communities for you know, the next generation or more. I'd love to talk a bit about fair housing and, and maybe start with you, Mary. Uh, one of the not so great surprises early this year was on January 2nd, HUD suspended the fair housing requirements for a submission of uh, assessment of fair housing, which is that um, 
There is a statutory obligation for anyone who's receiving HUD dollars, any of the jurisdictions receiving HUD dollars to affirmatively further fair housing. And the Obama administration put together a new suite of uh, rules and tools to be used. The rules and the tools have now been suspended. Uh, what does it mean for a place like Denver, which was engaged in a regional assessment with Boulder and Aurora, I believe it was? Uh, what, what are communities to do now that the stick is gone from the federal government, at least temporarily, and why is that work still important, if you think it is? I think this work is crucial, and I'd urge any city that's uh, in the process and those perhaps even that are early in to continue, even though the stick is away. I think they're, the carrot is frankly its own reward, if that makes some sense. I'm not sure I'm mixing my metaphors all up. But the value of the analysis and the value of the affirmatively furthering fair housing, the AFFH tools that you talked about, really gives people a chance to look much beyond the individual issue of housing costs and rents and eviction, that kind of data, and really put it in the in the context of the what's happening in these communities and frankly, as you indicated with, with Denver, in a regional context, because we can't just wall ourselves off and say, we're looking at these boundaries of housing and that's the extent of it. This is a regional marketplace. And uh, if you're doing the analysis correctly, the value is that you're looking at transportation. You're looking at where the job markets are. That's a key piece of housing information because if the affordable housing is in this neighborhood but the jobs are over here, the job, you have to have the transportation to connect the two things. You have to be able to say to yourself, well, housing is about rent or mortgage payments, but it's also about wages. And how do we address these questions of initial wages, are they living wages, are these career path jobs so that after four years, five years, ten years, someone's income is increasing, someone's ability to sustain themselves in a housing opportunity is increasing. We have a assumption that people are going to move up and on, but we need to make sure we're looking at whether that's even possible, whether the building blocks are there. So all of these factors, and there are many, many more that go into the AFFH process, really provide housers, housing agencies like housing authorities, for example, to convene tables where they he were hearing from people they really didn't always have the opportunity to be in conversation with. And I want to stress in that that community residents, community activists, community agencies from all sectors really have been vibrant participants in this AFFH process, and that's golden. Whether you're forced to by the federal government or whether you're trying to come at this from the most comprehensive of solution. That um, ability to hear from residents of what their actual problems are rather than what the, uh, the, the, the assumptions might be is really what's going to make a community uh, sustainable over time. We make des development decisions a lot based on an individual project. And the flaw in that is that it may serve and be attractive to a population that you anticipate coming, but it's not necessarily what the actual residents of the, of the community that right now need. This process allows you to have that determination. I, I could talk about this a lot. You probably don't want me to. Um, but I do just want to put a pin in the fact that from the work that Policy Link has been doing for a very long time on the issue of housing and on just about anything else, we really put at the very top, the very apex, hearing from and accepting and appreciating the wisdom and the voice and the leadership of people who are experiencing the circumstance. They're really the best place to find the effective solutions. And so that's, again, one of the reasons this AFFH process for us is a, a very meaningful and worthwhile thing to continue. And I'd just love to jump in there, too. Um, what was most disappointing about seeing the administration's rollback of AFFH is that it was developed over several years with stakeholder input from uh, across the board. Enterprise did a great job of leading a, a broad coalition of folks to to work directly on that issue. And um, you know, we all know racial segregation is a result of federal housing policy, uh, and this is is really essentially taking away the tools that help local communities identify patterns of segregation, identify where uh, they can be making a difference. It's, it's undermining their ability to correct this, um, um, you know, 
centuries, decades long um, racial discrimination that's still playing out today. Um, but it's not the only place that we've seen this administration roll back on fair housing uh, um, commitments. So changing its mission statement to remove its uh, focus on inclusive communities that are free from discrimination. We saw them halt high priority investigations of, federal, of fair housing um, complaints. We've seen them um, attempt to stop uh, the, the move to small area fair market rent, which would uh, provide an easier opportunity for people, for people to move to uh, areas of opportunity. We've seen it at multiple layers, um, and this is just the latest one um, in the last year and a half of attacks on fair housing. And, and I think that's why it's, it's incumbent upon uh, private organizations uh, to kind of take up the banner of fair housing themselves and go out and try to enact programs and policies that will continue to move us in that direction. Uh, you know, by no means is Freddie Mac a perfect organization, but one of the things that we want to ensure is that there is fair housing out there for folks. So we have in our uh, own legal department a uh, just council that focuses specifically on fair housing issues, both in the single family and multifamily space. Specifically so uh, when there are complaints from uh, tenants or uh, folks in a marketplace that are trying to purchase, if they hear that there may be a lender doing something wrong, if they hear that there is uh, a renter uh, who, uh, of a property that we've backed, they can, there is another place that they can go. And then we can take it upon ourselves to try to figure out, well, you know, is this literally what's going on? Do we need to continue to do business here? So I think that's you know, something that in, in the absence of having that stick, if you will, temporarily. Uh, there are organizations like ours, the private organizations, are going to have to get themselves out there uh, and be proactive in that space. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. So we heard the Deputy Secretary say that the proposed rent reforms coming out of the administration are open for discussion. How are you thinking about responding and how you're gonna plug in, if at all, and uh, advise HUD? Um, and the bigger question would be, what, what does work to move people out of poverty to be able to afford market rates when they've been living uh, at the very bottom of the income strata? Uh, and the, the rent proposals are, have, are so deeply uh, important for us all to be paying a, a lot of attention to. Um, it, I think it really reflects a, a, dis, uh, a disconnect between the understanding of why people are living uh, in affordable housing in the first place, and that's because there's this ever-widening gap between wages and housing costs. So we've seen more renters than ever before. We've seen a chronic underinvestment of federal, um, federal investments in affordable housing and rental assistance. Only one in four people are who are eligible receive any help uh, of any kind. Um, and you see incomes that are flat, especially for people who have the lowest incomes. And so the idea of raising rents on um, the poorest families, um, even in the name of simplicity and in transparency, um, it, it, every dollar that they pay is going to be taking away from dollars that they could be investing in their children and their future and their health. Um, um, I, we think it's such the wrong way to go about it. Same thing with work requirements, de facto time limits. Um, it just doesn't reflect the reality of what's out there on the ground. There are much better ways of doing this even within HUD's existing programs. There's a great program called the Family Self-Sufficiency Program that is a voluntary program that works with families to identify five-year goals. Instead of um, increasing rents when they increase their incomes, that money would go into an escrow account. Um, it's been highly successful, but um, funded at a relatively low amount. We're advocating for increased funding for that program because we think that's a much better alternative. Uh, but there are also a number of reforms that Congress passed on a bipartisan basis um, unanimously through the House, which um, uh, you don't see that very often when it comes to housing policy, um, that HUD could be implementing right now uh, that would help encourage uh, and incentivize increased earnings, but without uh, the punitive cost of taking away housing from people 
uh, which we know uh, would only make it much more difficult for them to uh, maintain um, uh, jobs in the first place. And I do want to mention there's been a lot of talk about not seeing rent increases on elderly and people, uh, elderly households and people with disabilities. I, I cannot say it enough that that is not true. Um, those rent increases do apply to elderly households. Um, it's phased in for current tenants, but new elderly tenants that are moving into a federally subsidized housing would see those, those increases immediately. Um, and so it's really important to also just get the facts out there about what that what these rent increases really mean. Yeah, can I really step in? I think we probably are all champing at the bit to <laughs> applaud these comments and to say how urgent it is to, to change that narrative, to correct the record of what's being promoted as um, something that's necessary and what really is mean-spirited and more than anything else, counterproductive. It won't help, it won't save money, it will do nothing other than create um, a, a population that is going to be displaced this time by the federal government and this time in a way that will only exacerbate the pressures we've already been talking about. If you think that you can produce your way out of our affordable housing crisis and our homelessness crisis, you're wrong. We're going to need to do that as well as preserve and protect the people who are housed right now. And these types of rent increases, as has been indicated, will just push that right along the path. And, you know, that division of the population that's housed into some sort of category, whereas it's, it's we want to look out for seniors, at least claim to look out for seniors and people with disabilities and not for others, the work requirements and things like that, again, they're counterproductive. They take a whole segment of the population and would have it be homeless as opposed to others. It, 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 it is really such a, a mean and, and, as I said, inefficient way to do it. To your point about what would work to help people be able to afford better housing, I, I want to make a couple of quick points. One is. It's not the individual's burden alone to solve. <laughs> An individual who's on a minimum wage or a, a fixed income can't solve our housing pri problems that are systemic, that are historic, that have long, long, long roots in ways that have privileged some and hampered others. Um, some of that is racialized, and a lot of it is something that we've looked far away from and not and turned away from instead of trying to address. I also want to put into context that for the same population that is um, reliant on public housing, we see them impacted by a whole array of factors which strip their incomes and wealth. And so rent is one of them, but we really need to be aware of all the other things that eat, in, eat away at the income of low-income people. Fines and fees. You get a ticket if you're low income. Uh, if you don't, if you can't pay that $200 parking ticket, it turns into a warrant. It turns into interest. You know, very, very excessive costs that people end up paying. Um, the whole question of bail. We could talk for hours about bail reduction and how folks being um, charged with crimes, held for uh, days and days, losing jobs because they can't afford the bail, puts people who are already poor in a cycle that's just a bigger downturn and takes them further away from being able to afford a higher rent. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about these things like transportation costs if you live far away from your job, food costs if you live in a place where you don't have access to food at all, to say nothing of healthy food. All of these things put an incredible burden on low-income people on a, a very small income. Health costs, we talked about that a little bit. So it's just a question of looking at people holistically, uh, looking at them as more than just a rent level, uh, and looking at them as more than just a widget in an apartment or a unit. We really do need to understand a community and neighborhood context. And frankly, I think the proposal from HUD is going in the opposite direction from that. And I think with that, we will give you the last word. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. Before we get up and depart, we're going to take a short break. We'll start the breakout sessions promptly at 1030. I'd ask the panelists and the moderators for the breakout sessions to arrive a few minutes early so you can get set up. Thank you very much.